I once auditioned for a show by Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein called Pipe Dream, and it played in this very theater. I was in awe of their work because beginning with Oklahoma in the middle of the Second World War, they had pioneered a kind of show in which the story was more important than anything else. In the 1940s and 50s, dramatic stories were transformed into a wealth of Broadway classics, including the Lerner and Low musical that I took instead of Pipe Dream, My Fair Lady. Oh, how lovely it was, the golden age of the Broadway musical. Throughout World War II, with the threat of enemy aircraft a constant fear, the lights of New York City were frequently turned off. Broadway, target number one for pleasure seekers of the world. Oh, you can douse its glimmer for an hour. You can pull some switches and make it dark as pitch. But the lights are all there waiting. And they'll come on again as sure as shooting. Because this is Broadway. Because this is America. As wartime enveloped New York, the 47-year-old writer and lyricist Oscar Hammerstein II retreated to his farm in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. There, in the spring of 1942, he was struggling to adapt Georges Bizet's opera Carmen into an all-black musical. My grandfather was at a low point in his career. He was considered something of a has-been and a relic of an earlier time. Uh, his greatest hits were a good 11, 12 years behind him. He was no longer working with anyone, and he was trying to refocus his craft. I got to know him in the country, not in the city. He was a surrogate father to me from the age of 11 to 15. Oscar saw in me somebody he could pass knowledge on to, somebody who was interested in writing songs. Essentially, what I associate him with is that front porch and sitting there, you know, and looking at the, at the sunset over the fields and the cows in the distance, and his kind of open-hearted view of the world. In April of 42, Oscar received a phone call from composer Richard Rogers, who wanted to adapt a play about cowboys and ranchers into a new musical. Roger's partner, Larry Hart, was in ill health, depressed and unfit to work. But Hammerstein was intrigued by the homespun drama and teamed up with Rogers. The resulting show ushered in a new era in musical theater. Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain, and the wave and wheat can sure smell sweet when the wind comes right behind the rain. Oklahoma is a very simple story, but it is a story. And it is about character, though on a very naive level. It attempts to explore relationships the way a play does. And that had not been done in commercial musical theater. Musical comedy, which is what it was originally called, stopped really with the Rogers and Hammerstein shows. The, the word comedy got dropped. It was then the musical. And from that point on, the creative drive of the shows was from the, uh, the, the writers of the show. You're doing fine, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, okay. Oklahoma signaled the beginning of a time when a well-crafted story poignant, funny, or dramatic, became the essential element of the Broadway musical. When Dick Rogers left Larry Hart to work with Oscar Hammerstein, he gained a partner who favored sincerity over cynicism, and who wrote the dialogue as well as the song lyrics. Oscar invented the musical book. 
it started to take form in Showboat. And when he got finally to Oklahoma, he was dealing with a book that was quite difficult. He made the score follow the book instead of, it had always been the other way around. The book had been following the score around somewhat like uh, the elephant keeper uh, and cleaning up after it to make it a show. Suddenly, along came Oscar, and the story took over. The farmer is a good and thrifty citizen. Yeah, he's thrifty, all no right. No matter what the <laughs> Hellman says or thinks, you seldom see him drinking in a bar room unless somebody else is buying drinks. By the time they worked together, Rogers had already scored 30 musicals, while Hammerstein had written 27 shows. They drew upon this vast experience in reimagining the musical form. No musical numbers to showcase a star. No songs written just to become popular hits. Even the show's opening number went against the grain of expectations. The curtain went up. There was an old lady sitting there churning butter. Churning butter? That's the opening of a musical? And everybody's saying, what kind of a show is this? What kind of a show is this? Looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going by. Oklahoma also changed the role that dance played in a musical. Choreographer Agnes DeMille was the niece of the epic filmmaker Cecil B. DeMille, and she had strong ideas of how dance could do more than simply entertain. I think one of the landmark innovations in the American musical was made by Agnes DeMille. The Dream Ballet, Laurie's Dream had never been seen on Broadway stage because the dancing became storytelling. In DeMille's Dream Ballet, the choreography explored Oklahoma's love triangle. Laurie, a flirtatious young girl, Curly, a love-struck cowboy, and Judd, a brooding hired hand. Oscar originally outlined a dream ballet with a circus. And I said to Oscar, Mr. Hammerstein, what has this ballet to do with the play? This is not the kind of dream that young girls who are worried have. It would be a dream of terror and a haunted dream. And so I said, also, you haven't any sex in the first act. He said, I haven't? I said, goodness, no. When Oklahoma opened at the St. James Theater, the United States had been at war for 16 months. With empty seats to fill, the cast offered free tickets to coax US servicemen into the theater. The GI's emotional response to the show hinted at the enormous success that was to come. Everybody who came to that show, all the soldiers, went overseas for the duration. And I remember so well that triple row of uniforms at the back the men watching this folksy show, happy, light, with the tears streaming down their cheeks because it symbolized home and what they were going to die for. There wasn't another empty seat for years. Not only was Oklahoma the hottest ticket on Broadway, but it led to a best-selling cast album that brought the original performances into living rooms across the nation. Oklahoma 
Homer played for five solid years, breaking the record for the longest running musical by over 800 performances. There are now over 600 productions, amateur and professional, in the United States each year. On any given day, two separate performances of Oklahoma are likely to be playing somewhere in America. We've got, got one day here and not another, another minute to see the famous sights. We'll find the romance and danger waiting in it. Beneath, beneath the Broadway, Broadway lights, but we've hair on our chest, chest, so what we like the best of the nights. Sights, sights, nights. New York, New York, a wonderful town. The Bronx is up and the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York, it's a wonderful town. Inspired by the success of Oklahoma, a group of young artists got together in 1944 to create a new musical. Adolph Green, Betty Comden, Leonard Bernstein, and Jerome Robbins were all in their 20s. Following the lead of Oscar Hammerstein, they set out to write what was then being called the Integrated Musical. We were all novices, we really were. We didn't know a goddamn thing about uh, doing a show. We just decided to write down, you know, what we wanted to do or not do. We wanted the show to be integrated. We wanted everything in it to serve the show. We wanted things to be direct and simple and honest and not fancy, not phony. I think we wrote all this down <laughs> on a piece of paper. The musical, entitled On the Town, was the story of three sailors on a 24-hour shore leave searching for fun and romance in New York City. One unusual thing about On the Town, which makes it unique, I think, even today, is Lenny's score is a symphonic score. The reason it hasn't happened again is that nobody could do it but Lenny. Bernstein was able to capture a kind of hyper-energized throb of the city, and he saw that the orchestra itself could be a major protagonist in the musical, and the dance sequences could have a kind of drive, a kind of danger that uh, was very powerful. Jerome Robbins had first collaborated with Bernstein on the ballet Fancy Free. Choreographing a musical gave him the chance to mix ideas from his classical dance background with whimsical stories and comic situations. It was all very contemporary. The war was still on, the sailors were around, the life was right there on the streets for us to see. He was very funny. Jerry was one of the few choreographers who really had humor. And the vitality of, of New York and, and ordinary people like subway riders and sailors and not magic swans or enchanted princes, but, you know, people. <laughs> On the Town opened at the Adelphi Theatre on December 28, 1944, and playfully captured the frantic search for love during wartime. I'm a lady hack, see, and I'm on the town and on the make. Hey, come here. This guy's on a 24-hour pass, and he wants to see the sights of New York. But, uh, I think he's kind of cute. So... Well, let's go up to my place. Oh, uh, I'd like to, lady. What's really fascinating is the sense of power that the women in On the Town have. These women have sexual drives, are assertive, are in command, and that, that you know, that, that Laurie from Oklahoma was invented, and one year later, you have Hildy and Claire who are like, come here, 
I need a man. Let's go to my place. Let's go to Cleopatra's Needle. Let's go to my place. Let's see Wanamaker's store. Let's go to my place. Go to Lindy's, go to Luke Chow's. Let's go to my place. Let's see Radio City and Herald Square. Let's go to my place. Go to Rubens. Go to my place. Go to Macy's. Go to my place. The Roxy. Go to my place. My Gimble. My Flat Eye. My building. My Along with the humorous escapades of its young lovers, On the Town vividly captured the spirit of a country at war with an uncertain future. Well, we were all in the middle of the war. My husband was in the army, and it absolutely colored all our lives tremendously. And the pain of being separated was uh, very tangible. Where has the time all gone to? Haven't done half the things we want to. Oh, well, we'll catch up some other time. There's so much more embracing Still to be done, but time is racing Oh, well, we'll catch up that did have the feeling of what a brief moment life and joy can be. The feeling of poignancy that you cram as much as you can into the few hours you've got because you don't know whether you'll have any more, that hangs over the whole show. To follow up the success of Oklahoma, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein made a daring choice, adapting Lilium, a bleak Hungarian drama, into a musical set in 19th century New England, Carousel. At the heart of the play was an intense but doomed love affair not the kind of romance that typified Broadway musicals. Say, tell me something. Ain't you scared of me? I mean, that's what that cop said about my taking money from girls. I ain't scared. That's your name? Julie? Julie something? Julie Jordan! I don't think they questioned for a moment the advisability of doing something about a guy who was pretty rough on his wife and who committed suicide. Oklahoma gave them the confidence to say, this is a great story. People don't usually do stories like this in the musical theater, but let's do it. If I loved you time and again, I would try to say. The ballad was one of the great centers of a musical, but the fact is that a ballad can't be sung until the characters know each other. You can't sing undying love to someone you just met. So Oscar invented the conditional ballad. The first one I know about was in Showboat, only make-believe. We're, we're just make-believe we're in love. Then comes Oklahoma, people will say we're in love. We're not, but people will say we're in love. And then Carousel comes along, if I loved you. It's all in future, it's all in conditional. And so you could have a wonderful ballad in the first act. That was Oscar's invention and brilliance. If I love you Rogers and Hammerstein were not timid about changing their source material. While the play, Lilium, was bitter and pessimistic, Oscar depicted a world where even the most troubled man could dream of his family's future with hope and optimism. My boy Bill, I will see that he's named after me. I will. My 
my boy Bill, he'll be tall and as tough as a tree. Well, Bill, like a tree. The soliloquy from Carousel was a change for Billy. And you're not sure you like the guy when he goes around slapping her and being rough with her and everything until he gets to the soliloquy and she just told him that he's going to be a father. And this brings out a whole nother quality. I can tell him. Wait a minute. Could it be? What? What if he is a girl? A girl. An audience responds to what's going on underneath. And it's very hard to listen to Carousel without being moved. It isn't just that he, it's basically a, a, a story that the audience wants to hear. Love conquers death, etc., etc. Whether you believe the happy endings or not, they're characters and stories that concern them. And it's because of the way Oscar told those stories. I gotta get ready before she comes. I gotta make certain that she won't be dragged up in slums with a lot of bums like me. My major memory in my teens is when Oscar took me to New Haven to see the first night of Carousel. I was so moved at the end of the first act that I cried into Dorothy Hammerstein's fur. She had this good luck fur she always wore, and you know, tears can stain fur, and I think she was never able to use it again because I was bawling so heavily. But I remember the way that the way the stage looked at the end of the first act, and I was just awash. She's gotta be sheltered and fed and dressed in the best that money can buy. I never knew how to get money. Within three weeks of the opening of Carousel, the war in Europe was over. For a brief time in the 1940s, the picture of a more inclusive America was reflected on the Broadway stage in shows like Call Me Mister, St. Louis Woman, and Finian's Rainbow, which satirized race relations in the Deep South. These ambitious shows, with their moral and social themes, still posed no threat to Rogers and Hammerstein, who seemed to own the box office. How many, please? One. That will be 660. What? <laughs> 660 for one ticket? I don't set the prices, sir. I don't know. Well, it's I... only 660 for the evening show. You can get the same seat for 440 in the afternoon. Oh. Well, what are the morning prices? <laughs> I mean, I don't care how early, you know. They don't have any morning performances. You mean Rogers and Hammerstein don't make any money in the morning? <laughs> Not in the morning, huh? Then why did they write that song about how beautiful it is? Well, that's when they take it to the bank. Oh. <laughs> With half a century of experience between them, Rogers and Hammerstein knew very well the business of show business. In order to control their own work and develop new properties, they became producers, knowledgeable, respected, and tough. Now everyone on Broadway felt the pressure to write a book musical. The idea for Annie Get Your Gun came from Dorothy Fields. She took the idea to Rodgers and Hammerstein, who were producing musicals, and all she had to say was, a musical about Annie Oakley, starring Ethel Merman. And Rodgers and Hammerstein said, we'll do it. To score the show, they ultimately turned to a man who wrote his first song in 1907, the incomparable Irving Berlin. Call me up some rainy afternoon. I'll arrange for a quiet little spoon. Think of all the joy and bliss. We can hug and we can talk. 
talk about the weather I Lorraine. Irving Berlin was very skeptical of these new kinds of musicals, which he called situation shows. And suddenly he was being asked, this old war horse, to write songs that fit character and dramatic moment. But he took the script home, worked one weekend, came back Monday morning, and said, how does this sound for a, what he called, hillbilly musical? Doing what comes naturally. They say that falling in love is wonderful, and you can't get a man with a gun. Three songs in one weekend. And Roger and Hammerstein looked at it, absolutely amazed, and said, we think this will do very nicely, Irving. When I'm with a pistol, I sparkle like a crystal. Yes, I shine like the morning sun. But I lose all my luster when with a bronco buster. Oh, you can't get a man with a gun. Among the showstoppers, Berlin wrote what has become the unofficial anthem of the American musical theater. There's no business like show business, like no business I know. Even with a turkey that you know will fold, you may be stranded out in the cold. Still you wouldn't change it for a sack of gold. Let's go on with the show. Annie Get Your Gun produced eight hit songs, an unheard of number for a single show, but the score did little to advance the new book musical form. It was old fashioned, the critics said. Yes, Berlin agreed, nothing but good old fashioned hits. Berlin was not the only veteran songwriter trying to stay current on Broadway. In the late 40s, Rodgers and Hammerstein had become sort of the kings of Broadway musicals, and Cole Porter had had, had several failures, and uh, maybe people thinking he was a little passé. Then came Kiss Me Kate, and that speaks for itself. He was never passé. <laughs> Another boat playing another show in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore. A chance for stage folks to say hello. Another... In 1947, when the writer Bella Spiewak suggested a musical version of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, Porter agreed to write the music and lyrics. We open in Venice, we next play Verona, then on to Cremona. But the last in Cremona, our next show is Parma. Let no be more be menace than Nantua, than Nantua, then we open again. Where? We open in Venice, we next play Verona. Kiss Me Kate featured a clever play within a play that intertwined a Shakespearean production with the tumultuous backstage romance of the leading couple. Broadway was always breaking barriers. My first line in Kiss Me Kate was, you bastard. And when I finally said it in the theater, the gasp from the audience was incredible. Oh, no. <laughs> it's slightly different nowadays, isn't it? Cole Porter led the way in writing adult songs about love and sex. It's too darn hot, it's too darn hot. I'd like to sup with my baby tonight. He wrote candidly, he defied the censors. He probably, more than any other songwriter in this century, made it possible for the openness that we have in all popular music. Cause it's too, too, too darn hot. It's too darn hot. It's too darn hot. Cole Porter and Irving Berlin did not have to reinvent themselves because Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein had found a new way of doing shows. If anything, they simply needed to reaffirm their ability to do what they always did so well, which was to write great songs and create entertainment that the public liked. With Kiss Me Kate's opening in December of 1948, Porter enjoyed the Broadway spotlight for three months before a new Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, South Pacific. 
open to glowing reviews. Some enchanted evening, you may see a stranger, you may see a stranger, but not a crowded room. And One day, Porter heard Some Enchanted Evening on the radio, and a friend asked, who wrote that song? Rogers and Hammerstein, Cole replied, if you can imagine it taking two men to write one song. South Pacific was the show Rogers and Hammerstein wrote that had to be a hit. They had written Oklahoma and Carousel, both of which were very, very successful. Then they wrote Allegro, and it was a kind of embarrassing failure. They needed their next show to be a hit, and South Pacific was that show. It hit a time in this country where there was still an emotional feeling about World War II. After the war, soldiers returned to an America that had changed little in its treatment of minorities. Overseas, they had encountered people of all races, and some had even come home with war brides. James Mishner illustrated the war's racial and cultural friction in his collection of stories, Tales of the South Pacific. Rogers and Hammerstein, working with Joshua Logan, based their musical upon two wartime love affairs. A lieutenant from Philadelphia meets a beautiful island girl, and a nurse from the segregated South falls in love with a middle-aged French planter. Rogers and Hammerstein had just one actress in mind to play the nurse, Mary Martin. Oscar had first met her in Hollywood before the war, when she was just an aspiring singer-dancer from the cow town of Weatherford, Texas. 10 years later, Oscar wrote her the part of a lifetime. Though she loves the Frenchman, the nurse initially rejects him because he has fathered two mixed-race children. In the South Pacific, a young American Navy nurse explaining her race prejudice says, I can't help this. This is emotional. It was born in me. A young Marine lieutenant, played by my friend here, Bill Fabbert, says, It's not born in you. It happens after you're born. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. South Pacific produced quite a lot of backlash, particularly over the song You've Got to Be Taught which a lot of people felt was unacceptable. Oddly made, and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught. Some businessmen came to see me and said, won't you ask Rogers and Hammerstein to kill that song, You Have to Be Taught? because it deals with interracial matters, and, and uh, we don't like the idea of the guy being in love with the island girl anyway, and this song just rubs it in. The show was long, it would have been very easy to cut it, and uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein asked me what I thought, and I said, well, if you cut that song, you, you cut the whole musical. And they said, that's precisely what we think. Instead of simply celebrating America's efforts in the war, South Pacific challenged the country to confront its deep-seated racial bigotry. 
For their achievement, Rogers and Hammerstein and Josh Logan won the Pulitzer Prize. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck if you've ever been a lady to begin with. Luck be a lady tonight. The integrated musicals of Broadway almost always featured a gamble on love. And in 1950, the gamblers and gangsters of Damon Runyon's short stories found romance in the colorful world of Broadway itself. The show was Guys and Dogs. Luck be a We called it a musical fable. See, Damon the Runyon, he wrote a kind of an idealized New York fella. My theory was to treat these mugs as ladies and gentlemen. I wrote Guys and Dolls as though I were Noel Coward. It was though all of our mugs and tough guys were the seven dwarfs, Disney characters. They were all lovable. Even our worst, our worst uh, villain was a, a big teddy bear. I had lived in New York all my life, frequently went on Broadway, saw the petty thefts and the gamblers and the, the evasive tricks that were carried on at the time. And my first job was to see if I could capture the general atmosphere in the opening scene of Guys and Dolls. The first 15 minutes of Guys and Dolls is all done musically, from the opening scene to the mission band coming on, singing Follow the Fold, followed by the three gamblers who go up the newsstand and sing, uh, I got the horse right here, his name is Paul Revere. Steer, it's from this a handicapper the that's real sincere. sincere. I think it's Valentine, cause on the morning line, the guy has got him bigger than five pass. to nine. So make it if it's half, he wins by a half. According to this here in the telegraph. Epitaph. Valentine. Paul Revere. I got the horse. Guys and Dolls had one voice because all the voices who made it happen talked in that same way. They all went to the same high school in Brooklyn. These were guys that knew this material. They had read Runyon as kids. And the guy who made the songs for this was maybe the truest mug of all, Frank Lesser. I'd love to get you on a slow boat. China. Lesser, maybe more than any other songwriter since Berlin, had an ear for that American vernacular. He was able to speak the language of the people rather than write generalized songs about love and June and moon and all those things. When Nathan Detroit, who's having a falling out with Adelaide, says, so sue me, sue me, what can you do me? I love you. That didn't exist in songs up to that point. People didn't talk that way in songs. They used songwriter language. The best years of my life, I was a fool to give. All right already. I'm just an old windy. All right already, it's true. So new, so soon, soon. What can you do? I love you. Oh, the prayer meeting. I forgot. I got With a go. winning combo of song, dance, and comedy, Guys and Dolls became an instant classic, immortalizing the wise guy world of Broadway for generations to come. It was uppermost in our mind to maintain the fable quality, and at the same time, it was a kind of a street musical. It's all make-believe. Broadway itself, I, I think, is just you look at it and it looks real. But what it's really about is once upon a time. When some lazy slob gets a good steady job and he smells from Vitalis and Barbasol. 
call it dumb, call it clever. Ah, but you can give odds forever. That the guy's only doing it for some doubt, some doubt, some doubt. The guy's only doing it for some doubt. Hi ho, everybody, and welcome to On Broadway tonight. Throughout the 1950s, the new medium of television raided Broadway talent for its programs, just as Hollywood had done two decades earlier. The prestige and sophistication of Broadway musicals was one of the top attractions for millions of eager television viewers. Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals were so popular that when General Foods presented a 90-minute tribute, the special preempted all the Sunday night programs and was broadcast on the three major networks simultaneously. Let's get on with it. Now, let's see, uh, who are you two again? Say, you're pretty famous. Every kid in the country knows you, Roy Rogers, huh? <laughs> King of the Cowboys. Then this must be Trigger, huh? No, no, uh, this is Hammerstein. Well, that's an odd name for a horse. <laughs> But it was Ed Sullivan's Sunday night variety show that was the most important showcase for Broadway musicals. Rodgers and Hammerstein appeared on the very first broadcast. And in 1951, accompanied by Gertrude Lawrence, they visited the Ed Sullivan Theatre at 1697 Broadway. <laughs> An appearance on Sullivan's top-rated program could turn a flop into a hit. Broadway songwriters Charles Strauss and Lee Adams even went so far as to write Sullivan into their score for Bye Bye Birdie. Me on the... Ed Sullivan show? <laughs> it was art imitating life and back again when Paul Lind led the cast in Him for a Sunday Evening. Ed Sullivan! Ed! Ed Sullivan! Ed! Ed Sullivan! Ed Sullivan! Ed Ed When I was about 19 years old, I auditioned for Richard Rogers, and I belted out my aria and sang it as loud as I could. And it, when I had finished, Mr. Rogers came up on stage, and he said, that was absolutely adequate. <laughs> and I went, uh oh, really? And then he cracked up and said, no, it was wonderful, and thank you. And he asked me if I had been auditioning for anything else. Uh, for the coming season, and I said, I have been speaking to Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe for a musical that they're considering called My Fair Lady, and Rogers thought about it for a moment, and he said, if they ask you, you should do My Fair Lady, but if they don't ask you, we'd be very interested in using you, and of course, it was the best advice I could possibly have had. Back in 1942, about the same time that Rogers and Hammerstein were embarking on Oklahoma, a 24-year-old New York City lyricist, Alan J. Lerner, teamed up with a 38-year-old Viennese composer named Frederick Lowe. We called Frederick Lowe Fritzy, and I met him in my very first show on Broadway. He played the piano in the pit, and he would say, same thing every night, he would say, someday, he was Austrian, they had an accent. He would say, someday, I am going to write the best musical on Broadway. Many, many years later, 
I'm standing backstage at the opening of My Fair Lady, and Fritzi came over to me, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, well, he said, I wrote the best musical on Broadway, and indeed he had. Lerner and Lowe spent years trying to turn a classic play, George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, into a musical. Oscar Hammerstein told Lerner it can't be done, admitting that he and Dick Rogers had worked on it for over a year before giving up. Pygmalion had no love story, a major problem for a Broadway show. The turning point for Lerner and Lowe came when they decided to follow the 1938 movie version. You see this creature with her curb stone English? Well, sir, in three months I could pass her off as a duchess at an ambassador's reception. No, no. Their lyrics and music would bring romance into the story of a poor flower girl named Eliza Doolittle. All I want is a room somewhere far away from the cold night air with one enormous chair and wouldn't it be lovely lots of chocolate for me to eat lots of coal making lots of it warm face warm hands warm feet and wouldn't it be Selected to play Eliza's teacher, Henry Higgins, was Rex Harrison, a temperamental actor who had never sung on stage. I knew I was never going to be able to sing properly, so I got this man in, and I said, what the hell am I going to do with this, <laughs> with these numbers? And he said, well, what about talking on pitch? From an average man am I. An average man of mine, of no eccentric will, who likes to live his life free of strife, doing whatever he thinks is best for him. Well, just a, an ordinary man. But let a woman in your life. Stop, 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 stop. Take it out. I demand that be taken out. I will never get used to it. You know, you rehearse with the piano, and then you hear the orchestra. And instead of hearing da 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 di da dum da 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 di da dum, you hear diddle 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 boom 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 diddle 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 boom boom boom, and you don't know where you are. This happens to many people, including a good singer. Well, Rex panicked. You have to come to some understanding about this, you know, otherwise the curtain will not go up tomorrow night. Rex Harrison's stage jitters and the inexperience of the leading lady were swept aside by director Moss Hart, and when My Fair Lady opened in March 1956, it was immediately hailed as a landmark of the American musical. I could have danced all night, I could have danced all night, and It's certainly one of the great opening nights with My Fair Lady, a classical breakthrough because it had intellectual content. I knew perfectly well I was seeing something a greater of its kind that I'd ever seen before, Julie Andrews at 18 or whatever, coming back into the library, you know, exquisitely dressed and singing, I could have danced all night, I could have danced all night. Oh, that was tremendous. I could have danced, danced, danced. This quintessential Cinderella story was irresistible to America, and My Fair Lady played for a record-breaking six years on Broadway. The original cast album stayed on the bestseller charts for 482 weeks, setting a record that would outlast Elvis Presley and the Beatles. The whole point about the musical is selling 
America, a showing America its dream come true. Stories about where someone starts at a disadvantage and through a combination of goodness, forbearance, and luck, triumphs. It's the triumph of self. It's the dream. That's what America is, and Broadway is always telling that story. In 1957, Mary Martin asked Rodgers and Hammerstein to write a single song for a play she was working on, a project that ultimately became The Sound of Music. During the writing, Oscar began to suffer stomach pains, and after rehearsals began, he was diagnosed with cancer. Oscar was dying, and he had a lunch for his birthday, and he had on top of the piano two small piles of formal photographs. He asked me if I wanted one. And I thought, you know, it's like my father giving me, you know. But I said, sure, I'd love to have one. I said, would you sign it? And he looked at me. Lunch was announced. He didn't know what, what he wanted to sign. Suddenly he got a smile on his face and he signed it. And it said, for Stevie, my friend and teacher, and in King and I, he talks about how by, by your pupils you are taught. And that's what he meant. And of course, it was a major moment for me, and still is. Hammerstein's lyrics for The Sound of Music offered new beginnings and the discovery of love in unexpected places. Its unwavering optimism was a fitting final statement of Oscar's philosophy of hope. of music with songs they have sung for a thousand years to many critics the sound of music seemed hopelessly outdated an operetta without innovation or modern sensibilities but audiences loved it and the feature film was a blockbuster reinvigorating the classic big screen musical to beat like the wings of the birds that rise from the lake to the trees. My heart wants to sigh like a chime that flies from a church on a breeze. But during the show's tryout in 1959, the uplifting story was tempered by Hammerstein's failing health. Not having Oscar there at the first place out of town uh, must have been very hard for everybody. The wonderful period at the end of the sentence was they needed one new song, so Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote Edelweiss. Edelweiss, Edelweiss, Edelweiss. Which was the last song they wrote together, the last song for The Sound of Music, and it's such a wonderfully simple, wrapping everything up statement. It's such a very simple lullaby of a song about flowers bloom and die, but they bloom again. Here's a man, he has a terminal cancer, and he's writing a song about things that always are blooming and always are growing. Oscar Hammerstein died at home on August 23, 1960. That night, for the first time in theatrical history, both Broadway and London's West End honored the same man. The lights in London were dimmed for three minutes in tribute, but in Times Square, traffic came to a complete halt, and the lights on Broadway were turned off completely. Bless my home. 